um, to our event on the future of the built environment industry. Uh, my name's Helen Santa. Um, I'm the executive director at Build Studios. For those of you who don't know us, we're a hub for the built environment sector based in Waterloo. Uh, so we're a collaborative workspace. We work primarily with small practices um, and unusually we're a multidisciplinary workspace. So we sit planners and architects alongside architects and interior designers and engineers and, and really just see what happens when you bring some interesting minds um, together in the same space. Um, we're a social enterprise, so we offer affordable workspace at below market rents, um, but we also have an events and professional development program um, within which uh, this event today sits. And um, we have a slightly unusual um, education and outreach program, which is delivered as a quid pro quo with our members. Um, so basically, as an, in exchange for the affordability of the workspace, we ask our members to take part in things like careers talks and outreach sessions with um, young people in the area. Um, really in response to the sort of lack of um, uh, quality careers education around careers in the sector and also in a bid to improve diversity and inclusion across the built environment. Um, before we start the session today um, I just want to let you know that the event is being recorded um, and uh, we'll be circulating a recording after the, after the event. Um, if you're posting about it on your socials please use the handle at build studios um, and if you could hashtag with um, Rebuild Studios, that would be great. So we can sort of keep tabs on what people are saying. Um, so to set the scene before we um, start over to our presentations today, um, uh, the Rebuild Studios program um, com corresponds with um, a temporary rebrand that, that we've, um, uh, we're undergoing at the moment to Rebuild Studios as we emerge from lockdown um, and focus on renewal and look at the future of the sector and what this means for the built environment sector. So for ourselves as a space provider, we know that we are having to become a lot more flexible to respond to people's changing needs for workspace now that everyone realised that um, working from home is actually really um, more than viable in most cases. What does that mean for us as a, as a provider of, um, of office space? Um, but also for the built environment sector more generally, um, the very nature of the projects and the challenges that we're asked to respond to. So how do we work together and collaborate when we're still working apart for most of the time? How do we engage with our clients and communities? And of course, the major consideration for us all of where will the work be coming from, as this is really ultimately what keeps the show on the road. Uh, today is the final event in the Rebuild Studio series. Um, we've looked at uh, various stages of setting up and running a business. So we began with some quick fire inspiration with startup stories from established practices. Um, we've looked at the need to diversify our work streams. Um, we've also dived into the detail of how to win work at competitive tender or competition, a particular favorite of mine. And um, we've spoken more generally about developing new business. So all the events are available on our YouTube channel. And, and today's event really is the culmination of this. And it, it rounds off the series, series by asking a big question, which is what next and where do we go from here? Where will the work be coming from? And how do we as built environment professionals respond to the changing nature of our towns and cities? Whilst coronavirus has undeniably had a dramatic impact in this respect, to some extent, we feel that this has precipitated changes that were already afoot. Alongside the rise of tech, smarter travel, managing the impact of climate change, the rise of experiential retail, just to name a few, we've also seen this alongside a public sector with dwindling resources that has at times struggled to keep pace and also a regulatory environment that has at times allowed markets to take charge, sometimes at the expense of a strategic plan or a more human perspective to what's being delivered. So for us as professionals, how we position ourselves to respond to this will be a really important factor in where we take our businesses over the coming years. I'm really looking forward to hearing um, from our speakers today. We've got a fantastic lineup for you and to get their take on what these changes in the physical and economic landscape of our towns and cities will be and what this means for the built environment sector as a whole. 
Um, today's format is going to bring us full circle from the start of the series. We'll have quick fire presentations from our speakers um, and we've deliberately scheduled these sessions at the start of the day to set you up with some inspiration and some key takeaways for your business. So very much looking forward to hearing what our speakers have got for us today. Um, the, with the caliber of the speakers we've got today, I think this is a session that could run and run, but we will wrap up at five past 11 and we'll make sure we've allowed some time for Q&A at the end. Um, I would urge you, please, if you have questions for the speakers, please, can you just put them in the chat field? I will then run the presentations one after the other and then we'll do a wrap up with um, Q&A at the end. Um, so let's start with our first speaker today. Uh, can I introduce Indy Johar? who's co-founder and executive director at Dark Matter Labs. Indy, over to you. Uh, good morning, Helen, and good morning, everyone. Uh, delighted to be here. I'm, to be honest, I'm really struggling with my, um, with my Wi-Fi, so I'm going to unfortunately have to uh, try to stick on audio. Um, so I suppose where I want to start this conversation is that it, I think we need to look at the next few years in a very structural sense. This isn't about bringing 2008 problems of let's build a few homes and it'll all be fine. Um, I think we're seeing a structural transformation of our society and the way we live. So central business districts and the kind of retail urban renaissance narrative that was built in the 1990s is dead. Let's start by assuming that the kind of Richard Rogers kind of perverted vision of actually, which turned into a kind of thesis of a retail central urban business, central business districts all of that thesis is at the end of a cycle. We are not going to be living in an inner London, outer London thesis or an inner Birmingham, outer Birmingham thesis. That, that dichotomy, that kind of mechanism is no longer viable. Let's also start by recognizing that public transportation is becoming increasingly virtually unviable. So whether it's bus transports or tube transports, certainly in the middle of this crisis, let's also start by recognizing that people's preferences are changing fundamentally. So I would argue that we're going to see a pretty significant shift in preferences of where, where and how people want to live. So London, even in this situation, is less than 35% of mobility of what it was pre-COVID. Um, we are looking at at least 30% reduction in office use space, which was knocked down into retail and everything else, it, at least 30% reduction. We're seeing a shift in the economic geography of where we work and how we work. Our local neighborhoods, I live in Acton, is gonna be way more, way, way, way busier than actually central London. Retail will shift from central London out into the suburbs. Suburban retail will become more valuable. I think we're looking at quite a trans structural transformation of the way cities operate and live. When you combine that with the role of technology in terms of spatial computing and other capacities that are coming forward, I think we're looking at a significant reconfiguration. Then you look at another thesis, which is the role of civic assets. So we've done work around whether we're seeing the rise of community urban forests. Uh, we're looking at cities like Milan, which are looking at large scale reforesting program of cities. We're gonna massively increase the ecological cover of cities, not because we just want it or think it's pretty, because we need to deal with heat island effects, which are gonna drive cities to four and a half degrees warmer in other parts of the, other parts of the country. So we're gonna see an ecological transformation of our cities, which is also gonna be deal with flooding risks and other aspects. We're going to have to look at actually, we, our human logistics and human movement is gonna reduce, physical box logistics is gonna increase. That's gonna change the logistics infrastructure of our city. We're gonna look at food systems being transformed. We know next year in terms of food risks, food is a significant risk in terms of global food prices. So we're going to look at large scale. America right now is at 51 million people unemployed. What does that look like in the UK in the next few months and weeks when we talk about five, six million people unemployed? So we're seeing, and then when you combine that with any thesis of automation, you start to see an economic ge geographic shift. And my big plea to this room is start thinking afresh. Stop selling the same tropes of kind of, you know, the coffee, coffee laden cappuccino culture of kind of urbanism and a kind of right in the center of town, let's get to medium density and it'll be fine. I think we need a very structural transition in the way we live and how we operate. And that's coming whether we like it or not. And whether you look at the ecological level, whether you look at the role of civic assets, whether you look at the way we work, whether you look at even at your thesis on housing, all of this stuff will change. 
And underpinning it is where is our quote unquote growth coming from? Where is our development coming from? Our human development infrastructures, mental health is actually a really fundamental issue, but not just in a regressive way, not in a way of managing deficits. Mental health is the foundation of our new economy. So if you go in places, work in places like Sweden, working with Stockholm region, you start to realize that they see mental health as the basis of the next economy. So when you start to look at this as physical, as public health transformed our cities in the 19th century, mental health will drive the transformation and positive mental health infrastructure will drive the transformation of our physical cities right now. Light pollution, air pollution, sound pollution have significant micromolecular effects on effectively our built environment. I've probably got one more minute and I'll just sort of, and I think when you look at our physical internal built environment, it's all optimized around real estate. Everyone is trying to get real estate more efficient. Every bloody metric is about how many more people are utilizing that real estate. It is not the real estate that we're trying to optimize. We're trying to optimize human development. The metrics have been fundamentally misaligned. Real estate is just 10% of the cost of an organization. 60% is humans. So your greatest efficiency is improving the value and the productivity and the unlocking the full capacity of what it means to be human. And that means like smart rental contracts, which look at indoor, indoor air quality. Most of the buildings we work in have between 500 performances massively impaired as a result of that. So if we genuinely want to build a new society, a new economy, we're going to have to make much more structural transformations into our built environment at a molecular level, whether it's CO2, whether it's indoor, indoor effluence, all the way through to all the bullshit of co-working, which I don't think works. Right. So one of the things we've realized very clearly is that actually it doesn't work. Communication levels do not increase. You know, what co-working works as is building communities. It doesn't work through density of utilization. Actually, what people increasingly need is private considered space in an increasingly con complex world. I think a lot of the data and a lot of the facts that we were using were misaligned. And I think we as a profession became sellers of a kind of real estate optimization reality. What does the future look like if we really start to transform and focus on human development? I think build different forms of cities. That's it for me. You're, you're mute, Helen. Indy, what a fantastic way to start. Thank you so much for, um, for that introduction. I think this sort of human focus is something that I'm very interested in exploring. And I think even at Build Studios, it's interesting how our language has changed um, since, uh, since this has all begun. Um, and we're talking much less around um, space requirements and more about people requirements and time requirements. And I think even just the language we're using is changing in this respect. Um, I'd love to pick up on that more, um, a bit more in the, in the Q&A. Um, so can I now uh, pass over to um, Sarah Akibogan, who's um, the director and founder of uh, Studio Aki, uh, to give her, her take on this issue. Sarah, over to you. Thanks so much for joining us today. Hello. Hi, hello. Uh, thank you very much, Helen. Uh, so I'm Sarah Akibogan, as you've said. Um, I'm an architect and filmmaker, just to talk a little bit about um, my work and, and my approach. Um, so I'm kind of a, a, a transdisciplinary practitioner. Uh, film, architecture and uh, theatre also, so, so performance, which I use to kind of, as, as a way of activating dead community spaces, as a way of creating community networks, and as a way of um, kind of, when, when you do projects like this, you build an entire community around the project. And I find that interesting because it's something that's very much um, missing, I think, from built environment practice. Um, especially as you kind of scale up. So something I've learned um, in theatre practice is that theatre, especially fringe theatre, is a much more kind of agile, um, is, a, is a much more agile environment and much more able to sort of respond rapidly um, to, to, to issues, to political issues. So I'm going to start by showing uh, a little film which kind of will help position sort of where I am today in my thinking and 
also kind of summarizes some of the work that I've been doing recently. And then I will bring that in back into my sort of um, thoughts about how we respond to COVID and some of the issues that the pandemic has, has raised. Last year, I started the XXAOC project to search for and make a film about female architects of colour. We were kind of a big, happy community talking about architecture as the revolution. Our stories seem to be very much missing. The whole time of thinking that you could change the world. Why is it that we are seemingly invisible? These women have achieved things, they have designed things, they have been part of the built environment. It shouldn't be a surprise that architects can be from different cultures and minority backgrounds. It should just be celebrated early on. It would be great um, for younger people to say, I know what an architect does, and they can be from everywhere. Uh, so, of course, uh, I start there because access to the built environment um, diversity has been a, a sort of big issue that's, uh, that, that COVID has raised. So it has been said that uh, before Corona, after Corona, BC, AC, things will never be the same. Um, but the dual challenges of COVID do present an opportunity, indeed an imperative, I'd say, that we re-examine modes of architect architecture production, practice and education. Um, and the pandemic has of course exposed many of the fragilities around our current social and economic constructs, particularly in the way cities are used, who has, who has access to them and who creates them. Our cities belong to all of us. And for many of us, they're the places where we build our dreams, make our memories, have our families. They're the backdrop to our lives and they should be places where all of us can breathe, places where all of us can grow and thrive. Yet the pandemic has exposed extreme inequalities in access to space and decent housing and so on. And just the fact that people are not very well catered for by our cities, or at least not all people are. So I would argue that there needs to be a post-COVID revolution, um, that we need to really um, tackle this issue of change. Um, so the, the built environment, change, there needs to be change in not just industry, but also education. And we need to do that in order to tackle both the global climate emergency, but also issues of social justice, which I think are inextricably linked and which we as practitioners, um, people who run businesses should also be tackling. But my worry is that rather than, um, rather than there being a huge change, there will, we will simply revert to business as usual. Um, I find Johnson's um, recent call for us to build, 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 um, which is a promise that is um, will like you know is likely to be underfunded, um, and uh, although it's been branded a new deal, will actually be more like a, an old an old deal. It's potentially an, an opportunity, but it needs to be underpinned by by solid principles and and clear thinking. Otherwise, we're in danger of simply exacerbating some of the issues of gentrification um, and the inequalities that that has created. And, you know, we're, we're simply in danger of reinforcing some of the, the front lines, hard front lines that gentrification has created and that COVID has exposed. So um, uh, I'm also particularly worried by the, the recently announced uh, changes to the planning system, which uh, will, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's not often that I find myself completely agreeing with um, things that uh, RIBA presidents say, but I, I, I agree completely with Alan Jones that we're in danger of moving towards, um, and moving towards a situation we, where we just create new slums if we give developers uh, free reign. So I think that we fundamentally need to be thinking about dismantling old hierarchies in order to unlock um, talent and, and diverse thinking in order 
to create a kind of built environment uh, industry that all have access to as practitioners and educators and, and people that live in it. So, um, so fundamentally, I believe that our industry is, is broken. Um, I think that whether it's uh, in terms of large practice or, or small practice, I think that that, um, that, that, our, that our industry is, is broken. Um, so speaking as a, so as, as a large practitioner, I think, sorry, speaking from my kind of time in large practice, I think that um, one of the huge issues in our industry is mental health and the way that people are, are treated within our kind of long hours, sort of um, extremely sort of macho culture. Now, the pandemic has forced on us sort of new ways of working, new forms of social organisation, flexible working, and, and hopefully um, this is one of the things that we can tackle. Um, so new modes of, uh, so new modes of working potentially increase access for, for women and ethnic minorities and so on. So that's what, one of the things that I, that I hope we can hang on to post pandemic. Um, I would like to see our industry become one that learns from other industries, one that forms better links with academia. I'd like to see it become a more kind of diverse, more, a more dynamic industry. I think that fundamentally it suffers from a kind of inertia. We're very, very slow to, very slow to change. And I think that the built environment industry needs to be more like say for example, the tech industry. So kind of more agile, um, more adept at gaining access to funding for research um, and so on. And, and I think that particularly for small practices, adopting a kind of a, a, a startup model that's more akin to something like the tech sector is potentially, um, is, is where we should be going. So, uh, Thinking about uh, my time, so I, I used to work in large practice, very large practice, and I now work as a, a small practitioner. And during my time in large practice, I was particularly disillusioned by, uh, it was a particularly kind of commercial practice, and I was particularly disillusioned by some, but by, by that. But what I was impressed by was the way that some large practices have um, are able to work across disciplines so they have lots of skills in-house um, engineering model making filmmaking uh, product design and so on and then as a small practitioner uh, obviously it's very different you, there is potentially you are potentially isolated um, unless you work in somewhere like build studios and I myself happen to work in a, I'm based in a small studio called Rara which gives me access to um, other practitioners to um, to people who work in other creative professions and I very much think that that's the way um, the way the industry needs to move particularly small practitioners so it's not just about um, working sort of with the obvious disciplines that we've worked with so engineers um, uh, kind of um, M&E practitioners and so on it's also I think we need to be thinking about working with cultural theorists artists um, you know um, uh, scientists and so on in order to uh, in order to learn from other disciplines I find or have found architecture kind of traditional practice um, to be kind of very sort of rigid in in the way it's structured so in terms of um, in terms of legislation in terms of the in terms of what you sign up to as a traditional architect it makes it very um, the, the forms of practice are are very rigid um, so I for example and I'm trained as both an architect and an, and a structural engineer but it's very difficult to practice that way um, in the way that our industry is structured. And I think that that's something that needs a, a real rethink. It should be, it should be um, easier, simpler to practice across disciplines. And I think that at a small practice level, that's, that's really important. I think that otherwise the kind of margins at which we operate, if you operate as a kind of traditional 
architect, I'm speaking very much about architecture, but um, it, it becomes, um, it, it's quite difficult to make a viable business. So this kind of transdisciplinary approach, one that is supported by the structures surrounding the profession, I think are um, incredibly important. I'm not sure how I'm doing for time, Sarah, I'm gonna, it's, been, um, it's been fantastic. I'm actually going to move us along to the next speaker now, but thank you so much for that insight. And I think I'm really interested in kind of the good bits from coronavirus that will stick and how we can encourage that. And also what we can do as a sector to kind of try to ward off the bits that we don't want to return. And I think this issue around the pace of decision making is also something that I'd really like to discuss as well and the benefits of that. Um, so let me pass over now to um, Manisha Kelly, who's Festival's Curator at the v and um, Manisha, it'd be fantastic to hear from you on this. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be part of this panel. Um, I'm just going to uh, share my screen. See that right? Okay, so um, as many have recounted, 2020 has been a year of extraordinary change. Changes to our working, living, health, and social pattern caused by global pandemic has stopped us all in our tracks. In contrast to our previous state of ever growing projects in scale and ambition, 2020 has continued to be a year for reflection and pause. The plane stopped, and we could hear the birds sing again. Amid the fear of a deadly virus, there was a glimmer of hope for the planet. However, despite the lockdown causing the biggest drop in global emissions since the Second World War, this pause has had little impact on climate change. What has changed, however, is our attitudes. We no longer jet off for a weekend away or as easily give in to the instant gratification culture that was the status quo. Then, as lockdown continued, the brutal murder of George Floyd, subsequent Black Lives Matter protests, the anniversaries of Grenfell and Windrush, and the disproportionate COVID-19 BAME deaths coalesced to make an urgent conversation about racism and equity unavoidable. The pandemic has been a chance to reimagine what our future might look like, since the future we're expecting has changed. The built environment industry, on the whole, is sadly out of touch and desperately in need of reform. For too long, we have relied on systems created in a time of excess with no consideration for people or planet. We now have a chance to demand equity in order to move effectively into the future we truly, and in order to effectively move into the future, we truly need to understand our past. Just yesterday, the front page of the Architects Journal featured a piece by in, the engineers who helped artist Mark Quinn illegally mount his sculpture of the Black Lives Matter protester, Jen Reed, a surge of power, on the empty plinth in place of the slave-owning Edward Paulston. Many people, myself included, were initially delighted to see this triumphant sculpture in place. However, what actually took place that day was an opportunist stunt. Black artists and others have been enraged by the, the act. Black sculptor Thomas J. Price states, Mark Quinn's Jen Reed statue colonized the constant and hijacked the Black Lives Matter movement. It is a con. He has pointed out in numerous interviews that Mark Quinn is an incredibly wealthy artist born into a privilege from a very wealthy family and has benefited from a system that gives him access to things that black artists have to fight for to even get in small quantities. Quinn is sitting on the resources and the facilities to do a piece like this as soon as the opportunity arises, whereas Price has had to, to, have, has had to battle even to have the imagery of a black person accepted in public space. The Bristol community have been fighting for years to have a statue placed, yet Quinn, as a privileged white man, it was easy for him and, got, and received headlines around the world. Had he considered installing the statue without claiming it was his, or had he had he or the engineers responsible allowed the space to be occupied solely by Jen Reed and the Black Lives Matter movement, it could have been a genuine act to advance racial equality. Instead, what they've done is compromise space for future commissions. There's a real risk that the Quinn piece could overshadow any permanent sculpture, 
and therefore hinder real progress during a moment of activism that should have showcased a black man's, a black artist's output, not, not that of a white man. The fact that Mark Quinn asked the mayor of Bristol, a black man, Marvin Rees, for his permission to erect the sculpture weeks before the stunt was denied, but did it anyway, shows his disregard for the black experience. This performative sol solidarity is a barrier to progress at a time when we should be having nuanced conversations about how to make steps to heal past colonial wrongs in public space. These conversations should also extend to what our institutions uphold and represent. The RBA HQ 66 Portland Place itself is a love letter to the empire, dripping with ornamentation in praise of this period. Much of the material used in the fit out for 66 Portland Place was sourced by the Empire Marketing Board. Timbers such as Indian grey, silver, wood, Quebec pine, Australian walnut, and so on were used some for overt imperial iconography, which you can see in this, this wooden carved panel here. In effect, this is explo exploitation of natural resources from across the globe for the UK market. These actions were promoted and celebrated in a process in which architects were complicit. This screen in the Jarvis Hall is regularly used today. It depicts the Reba Council at the center of the empire with colonial and dominion parliamentary buildings. A Eurocentric gaze situates the subjugated, explo exploited people of the colonies standing on the edges. In, in just over, in, in just, sorry, in the three years when I worked at the RBA, I very rarely heard a critique of this building and its celebration of British imperialism. I'm pleased to see Dr. Neil Seashore is undertaking a comprehensive study of the RBA HQ unearthing its origins, symbolism, and legacy in a book due to be published next year. The RBA, whose recent history is marked by allegations of racism, needs a deep and considered strategy of how to reckon with its problematic relationship with representation. This certainly doesn't look like the future of the built environment. No organization or institution is free from this work. For example, Open House London is a major event on the architectural cultural calendar. It opens hundreds of buildings across London for over a quarter of a million people to enjoy over a weekend. Each of these buildings has a fact sheet produced by the Open House team, which details its history and architectural features. These are shared with the public and used in tours of buildings. Currently, they do not reveal the truth about much of our historic architecture. We know that the wealth amassed from slavery is visible in cities across the UK, especially Bristol, London and Liverpool. In the process of abolition of slavery in the UK, the, the 46,000 slave owners received the biggest payout in British history, equivalent to 70,000 billion pounds today, um, which was 40% of the British GDP at the time. The op Open House has the opportunity to be honest with its visitors about how buildings as part of its programme were commissioned using wealth derived from slavery. Chandos House here um, is an example um, of this and has been a regular fixture in the programme and is even the location for the volunteers thank you party after the open house weekend. The house was commissioned and built for by James Bridges, the Duke of Chandos, who was one of the largest shareholders in early British colonial development and a large scale plantation owner in Jamaica. This is just one example, but there are many, many more examples and I'm pleased to be advising the new director, Finn Harper, on the process of revealing these truths. We're having ongoing conversations about decolonizing the BNA, uh, where I currently work. We're reassessing our collections from a period of history that foregrounds colonial, colonialism and empire, looking at where there are holes, the lack of an Africa, an Africa gallery, for example. And we're beginning to analyze the pervasive narratives that do not critically assess exploitation and reinsert erase histories from how we inter interpret objects. I believe museums have a civic duty to make these spaces represent everyone in society equally and with dignity. Um, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen now. A few minutes. Brilliant. Um, Manisha, thank you so much for that. Um, I think this really important question around as we merge from 
lockdown, but more generally in the future, kind of who owns the spaces that we're operating in? You know, um, who are they designed for? Who are they designed by? And I think a move towards um, improved inclusion seems to be sort of long, long overdue in that respect. Um, now let me move on quickly to um, Lara Kinnear, who's um, Urban Studies Leader at the um, LSA. Lara, great to have you here with us today as well. Now, over to you. Hi, thank you for the invitation and great set of um, thought and presentation so far. Um, hopefully I'll pick up on a few um, bits of. Um, so the, the, I want to talk about two things and they focus on the how, not the what. Um, and it's a passion of mine for a very long time that we're very good at talking about what the problems are or, or what potential solutions are but we're not very good at working out how we can achieve them in a way. Um, and I, th I think that's one of the biggest takeaways for me from lockdown, that um, we have seen different ways that people have behaved, um, collaborated, um, addressed needs, and there's a lot to be uh, learned from that. So the first issue is around um, it, it's a bit of a fundamental one. It's about our understanding of the built environment in the first place. I got really annoyed at the beginning of lockdown when I started to see the signs that talked about social distancing, because I don't believe it was about social distancing. It was about physical distancing. And um, I, it started to really worry me that this was the wording that was being used across the city um, physically and, and digitally, because it made me we have so far to go to still um, get people to understand that the, the, the impact of our physical environment um, because if they couldn't get it in this context when would people get that the physical environment has a significant impact on us as individuals and on how the city works and it made me think back to um, something I learned in school and something that I've been practicing as a parent which is um, the understanding of, of a child's physical um, environment in terms of their development. Um, it's something that's very well documented and evidenced in social sciences. Um, why do we think it stops when you, you grow up? Um, it doesn't. It continues from when we're a child to, to um, when we're an adult. And so I think we have a real need to bring that evidence to the table much more strongly to show that our built environment really does have an impact. And, and the other thought I've had is, is around my upbringing in Belfast uh, during the Troubles. Um, you know, I, there was a very distinct physical, um, a number of physical interventions across the city when I was growing up, which meant I had a very unusual relationship with it. I couldn't go into the city centre after 5pm every day because it was shut down. And those physical barriers remain today, albeit in different forms. And the psychologist would say that for every year that a physical barrier existed in the city, it took 10 years to psychologically break that down. And I think we've got to be really serious about the physical barriers that are going up in our city in London at the minute and the impact that they will have um, and the terminology that we're using around it. Um, I, I think the more, you know, the, the, the wrong sort of messaging that goes out, um, the harder it will be for us to recover. And that it's harder for us as a, you know, within the built environment industry to try and um, recover from that as well. Um, the second issue is, is an, a well-established um, one and one that many people in this conversation um, work within. And, and that is around the struggle to holistically consider the built environment and therefore act in a holistic manner. The built environment involves many different disciplines uh, that require cross-pollination, but sadly we aren't taught that way. We're educated in silos, we practice in silos, our city modes of working are in silos, our governance is siloed. And the government response to the pandemic has in so many ways been siloed. And, and, and many times I've been, you know, even less hopeful um, uh, during the pandemic than I was perhaps before that there was a way out of this. But so that I'm not all doom and gloom, um, there has been uh, an outpouring of non-siloed working. 
and that has come in the form of collaborative exchange and and direct response to direct need a lot of the time it's from grassroots organizations um, or from uh, practices that um, have reached out and worked beyond their usual group of friends um, it's come from community groups partnering with arts organizations or mental health charities it's even come from some of the big multinationals apple and google decided to collaborate together for the first time ever um, on virtual healthcare services. Um, so we, we have seen an uprising of, of people that have gone beyond the usual red tape and protocols and have been galvanized by need to act differently, commit differently, communicate differently and deliver differently. And this is a behavioral change that I want to be part of sustaining um, because I believe the breadth of collaboration that these sorts of projects demonstrate is the only way that we will start to see the change we need in the built environment and the only way that we will come close to speeding up the delivery of change that we are already behind on. And when I say collaborative, I don't mean the architect and the artist and the engineer. I mean the architect and the economist, the behavioural scientist, the philosopher, the lawyer and and, and this really is the essence of a, a new form of practice that, that I'm um, established, I was establishing before lockdown, but this has almost been a, 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 a fuel to the fire to, to establish this as, as quickly as I can. Um, and, and it's also fueled a new project for me um, that I've uh, worked with others on to try and promote this sort of behaviour that we've seen during lockdown. We've created a new platform to promote and research how collaborations have come about and try to determine the value of these offerings so that they can be fully understood. So I will just share my screen with you just to share the website. Have you got that? Yes, trust you have it. Um, and it's very simple. It's just trying to create a space which gathers projects that can demonstrate the power of collaboration, of going beyond the usual way of working. Uh, the images aren't coming up at the minute because obviously this, this Zoom call is taking up all my bandwidth, uh, which is a shame. But anyway, ah, here's one. Um, and it's going to be a significant part of the new teaching programme at the LSA this year. Students are going to be asked to engage with it, research it, um, incorporate it within their work, because it's very much the fundamental agenda that we have at the LSA, which is to encourage architects to not follow what's been done before, but look at how new relationships with other professions, other experts, other evidence bases, can be part of them shaping the built environment in a more effective way. Um, so if anyone has any projects, I would love to hear from you and these can be uploaded. And I'll just... Um, and I guess the, the other thing just to end on, um, which I'm just gonna check my, I've probably got one minute left, um, is, is that not only have we seen the outpouring of cross collaborative working in a very different way, but very focused on need, it's been much more human based. And it's also been um, at the scale of the neighborhood. And I think we're seeing a lot of conversations about the neighborhood being the new scale of focus. Um, it, something that I've been interested in for a while is the 15 minute city agenda that the mayor of Paris committed to at the end of 2019 as her mayoral election pledge. She used that a lot during lockdown in Paris to start to rule out some of the cycle lanes and new modes of transport around the city, and in fact got re-elected um, just a few weeks ago. And I think the 15 minute city model is interesting because it's not siloed. It looks at places holistically. It looks across places of living, places of working, places how you move around the city. And it's very much human centered. Um, I think we're also seeing some really good examples coming out of Kate Rayworth's work on donut economics. Um, so I'm, I'm confident that somehow in what has been quite a messy situation for many people, we are seeing solutions and that they are very much focused on a more human scale and a more collaborative scale and a more holistic approach to things. Um, 
And by bringing very different people around the table, working in different ways, in different times, we do have an opportunity to achieve a lot. Our old ways of working are redundant and our time, I really believe, is up. And we have, um, you know, the future of people and planet depending on it. And I think us in the built environment industry have a lot to offer this situation. Lara, thank you so much. And thank you for um, uh, sort of ending on an upbeat note. I think this sort of solutions focused approach is really what we've got to strive for here. And this idea of collaboration, I mean, even achieving that within the sector is challenging, but you're right, it's absolutely got to kind of reach out to other sectors as well, if we're really going to affect change. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'm conscious of time, but um, I want to um, uh, make sure that we uh, kind of get the, get the most out of our speakers this morning, as I think that the, um, the insight that's been given is, um, is really, really helpful in terms of the sort of forward-looking piece for the sector. So let me move next to Samita Singer, um, Director of Ecologic Architects. Um, Samita, thank you so much for joining us today, especially as I know you're, uh, you've been feeling poorly. Um, really, really appreciate you having on the panel today and um, look forward to hearing from you today. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Helen. So welcome, everybody. Good morning. Uh, so I, I want to say that I come from this issue from several different angles. So I, as, as Helen mentioned, I, uh, I run a small practice called uh, Ecologic. And it's a collaborative practice. So I've done uh, fairly large projects, urban planning, et cetera, in conjunction with other practice. So it's kind of about collaboration. Um, I teach part three. And so within my teaching, I've noticed how things have changed with the pandemic. Not only did we have to change the way we were teaching, but we were also um, looking at uh, students who who didn't, couldn't go on site, um, you know, work had stopped or they were furloughed uh, and things like that. Um, I started and I run a design charity, Jarushila, which has worked all over the world. Um, and I am trustee of the Architects Benevolent Society and the Commonwealth Association of Architects. And in particular, I would focus on the Architects Benevolent Society because we have seen a rise um, in people applying for, um, you know, they're, they're suffering uh, financial hardship or mental stress. Um, so if you do, you know, I'd say, please go on their website. There's very good um, um, options for if you're, if you're suffering from stress, uh, there are ways uh, they offer help. So please do go on their website. So I've also written books and in, um, 2014 I was writing this book and I'd actually started thinking about how architects could uh, work in the future even though there was no pandemic in, in sight then and some of the things that I'm sort of noticing now are uh, quite interesting because they coincide with what I've written. Um, I sit on the RIBA professional conduct panel. I've been involved with the RIBA for about 30 years and um, more pertinent, I think, to all this is the fact I'm a non-exec director of Moorfields Foundation Trust and also a member of uh, Public Health England's Sustainable Development Unit. So I've seen the effect of, because I chair the workforce committee at the Trust, I've seen the effect of, that COVID has had on um, our workforce, and uh, on patients. Uh, we lost two members of staff. So it's been a very personal journey for me. So at the moment, going back to architecture, we have a situation where 75% of our um, uh, buildings have all, were already built by 2008. And um, so, you know, we are, we're actually looking at a very small section of the pie at the moment. And again, another fact is 97% of the world's buildings are not created by architects. So it's only the very special iconic buildings or one-off stuff that we see are creative architects. If you look around the world, you know, people are building whatever they want to build. Um, so on top of that, we have, uh, especially with the RIBA, we have 50,000 um, uh, chartered members and 75% are small practices under 10 people. So it, is the high, it has the highest level of self-employment in all the construction sectors. 
Um, and they, these small practices have problems with uh, experience, uh, getting experience, getting insurance, um, uh, on, and getting onto the framework for larger work. So, and then we've had Brexit. So we've had a skill shortage. 25% of architects who are working in the UK came from the EU, and, um, and, but now there's a different threshold. There's a 30,000 uh, 30, salary threshold for overseas workers. So um, a lot of you know, small architects practices can't afford that. So there is discussion going on. And the, the thing is that the real impact of what's been happening with the pandemic and with the global shutdown will, uh, will be noticed when the furlough scheme starts to be withdrawn in October 2020. So I think one of the other speakers mentioned that perhaps you know, 2020 is a bit of a write-off. Uh, there's been 28% drop in workloads as of June 2020. But we're hoping that 2021 will have a V-shaped recovery um, and will go back to sites, pick up the jobs we weren't working on. Um, and also this physical distancing that Lara mentioned, you know, is making site work slow. And so people, and also in London, particularly getting to offices and sites, using the tube is, is very difficult. You know, there's a risk of catching infection. So what we'll see is probably people finishing up the jobs they already had before looking for new prospects. Now, looking at the strength that we offer, that we have as architects is we actually contribute 3.6 billion to the UK's economy. Now that's a, a good percentage where we do and uh, the work of architects is respected. So there, there is that thing that we come with that, um, uh, with that uh, knowledge that we are contributing to the economy. So the RIB is an international brand. It's, uh, you can see it across 115 countries um, buildings are always needed and other skills are needed, which architects have plenty, in, uh, plenty of. So what we need to do is actually work collaboratively. So even though we're leaving the EU, we have network of other countries where we can work in and we need to focus on working in collaboration with other people and think big, you know, where, where, are the, where are you needed? Perhaps, you know, it's not always the iconic buildings that are needed. Perhaps it's the disaster zones. Perhaps it's other areas, uh, you know, urban development. So uh, the COVID has also uh, given us opportunities for different ways of working. But we also have things like climate crisis, which is also going to be affecting us. So post COVID, we'll see this, um, we, we, we already have seen this connection between health, buildings, and nature, and evidence-based design. So I think where we are going ahead is sectors such as housing, schools, and healthcare will have a big growth. Housing for the elderly will also have a growth. Homeworking will affect housing standards. So you might need different kinds of homes. You might need extra space. Um, also with the climate change, we'll see in net zero carbon buildings. So I suggest, you know, if you've got time, just try and sort of build up on that knowledge. Retrofit become very important because as I said, most of the new buildings have already been built. So we need to think of retrofitting and thinking about uh, the climate crisis at the same time. There are some good uh, things coming out of the RIBA uh, that people are working on that. So um, either with or without change, architectural design services will be needed. We need to be hopeful. We need to work in different ways, new ways and work with change. You know, always accept, expect change and accept it too. Thank you. Samita, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for that. And also you've um, preempted one of my questions at the end, which was some recommendations of some specific sectors or specific subject areas where there are genuine opportunities emerging and where the bulk of the work is likely or could potentially come from in future and more thoughts about collaboration which is always music to my ears. Um, we have two final speakers um, so let me pass over to Peter Croft who's um, a principal urban designer at Dartford Borough Council and a public practice associate. Uh, Peter over to you. Thank you very much. Um, let me share my screen. 
And uh, Julie, I will try and be uh, done in four minutes. They start waving at me if I'm not. Um, so where do we go from here? Um, and this presentation is really a response to um, the government's uh, confirming yesterday what build, build, build means uh, for town centres. Um, in fact, means uh, change of use, demolish and rebuild, uh, i.e. where the market doesn't support town centre uses, we put housing. Um, and we're waiting on the detail, but I think this could be potentially the most consequential change uh, of the post-COVID era for our towns in particular, and our town centres. And it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, really, where um, uh, town centres are struggling, so um, you change and put uh, additional or you put residential uh, in there, which creates social conflict and uh, further kills the town centre. Um, and there was a response, the thing that really struck me though, I guess, was the response from the industry. And uh, despite strong words from a joint letter in the uh, RTPI, RBA, RCS, um, it was broadly an argument about process rather than substance in that they were saying that the process will produce poor quality homes and bad places to live. And I think the problem with the soundbite and also the response from the industry um, was that it, it loses the conception of what a town centre is um, in sort of accepting that what cities and towns are for are houses, but houses aren't an end uh, in the same way that roads and railways aren't an end in themselves. We have towns and we have town centres for culture and community, commerce, conviviality, um, and uh, there needs to be that understanding of what we're losing because there's no there's no reverse. There is, however, no getting away from the fact that physical retail is in decline, um, and that we're going to have an increasing surplus of, of shops and uh, office in more office buildings uh, in the near term onwards. So, retail is dying, but do we have to let town centres die with it? Um, and, and I think, you know, the government plan could be right for some, uh, some places, and it may be a solution for, for lots of places, but it's not the solution for everywhere. And it highlights the, the issue of um, centralising design control. Um, what we really need is local solutions for local, cha local challenges, and that's why uh, local authorities are best placed to lead the recovery. Um, and the, the, these photos are of uh, Dartford High Street. This is my patch. Uh, it's a very typical high street in a market town, um, but of course, in this case, typical really means it gives Dartford its identity. It means that it's not uh, a suburban extension to Bexley or, or Stone or Wilmington or places you haven't heard of um, because they don't have town centres. Um, but there was an issue even before uh, COVID of, of declining um, retail demands, even though the population is increasing significantly. And so what do we do instead? Um, this is my office, my office that I've been to twice uh, because I started work in April um, and uh, it's next to the station uh, and I think this could be the start of how you could shore up and change what our high street in Dartford is for. Uh, this is my local solution. Um, this is a big development site, the council owns all this land, they also own the land to the south and to the east. Um, but rather than knock down and rebuild uh, an office building, a spec office building, why don't you buy up uh, strategically and disperse the council functions, the public facing council functions and the office functions above along the high street to uh, support and shore up what's already there. And then we also uh, are looking at, uh, we've got a lot of sites on the edges of the town uh, for colleges and further education, they have huge catchment areas. They're not about necessarily their locality and serving the, the suburb that they're next to, but have a much wider catchment area. Uh, why are we building these on the edge of town? We've got North Kent College at the bottom of the image uh, and then academies uh, out around there. Why don't we take these uh, and bring those uses into the town centre um, and, make, and make use of bring young people into the town centre, bring football into the town centre activity, um, and, and start mixing those uses away from retail. And then finally, the council is, is, is well placed as, as a sort of, uh, to be 
doing this in that it has the long-term stewardship of, of the area. Um, it has local knowledge in terms of data, feedback through local democracy and direct communication, and is also potentially could have the ability to create new markets. So, so taking spaces, providing spaces for businesses at, at low, uh, low rates uh, and allowing space for new ideas. So in terms of uh, where the emergency, uh, the opportunities are emerging from disruption and where there will be new work coming from, I would argue that it needs to be uh, a local solution. Um, local authorities are best place to do that. And so uh, come and speak to us, come and speak to us with your ideas uh, uh, about how we can um, rebuild and shore up our town centres. Peter, thank you so much. Really good to have um, a public sector perspective on all this as well, because my perception at the moment is actually in many ways, the public sector is the only, only people, anyone spending any money at the moment. Um, so I think in terms of immediate opportunities, this is, um, you know, very, very interesting angle for people to pursue more about reimagining a lot around stewardship and how also we can kind of come together and collaborate to um, come up with solutions for this. So, um, to, to finish, this segues very neatly um, into uh, Julie's uh, presentation, actually. Um, Julie's a, a, a specialist on all things um, town centre. And um, Julie, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on, on where, we go, where we go from here. Thanks, Helen. And I will speak as rapidly as possible. And I think lots of my comments are probably summarising a lot of what we heard before. So let me start by saying I come at this from an urban geographer's point of view. And I worked through, as many of us did, those early weeks of lockdown, kind of wondering what was coming and what was happening to us. And, and I actually completely concur with um, two or three of the speakers and many others who have, who have documented their thoughts on this. That is, whilst COVID is an enormous global crisis, it's also an amazing opportunity to rebase. And I absolutely relish the opportunity to do that in our careers and our personal lives. And I did a series of um, uh, sort of published posts on LinkedIn in those early weeks of lockdown, and I'm just going to run through very, very rapidly three of them um, in an order that feels reasonably logical to talk through with you. Uh, but, but the first one, it came forth um, in my thinking. The first one is talking about human senses, and I think a number of our speakers have, have said this too, and inevitably, I think probably coming from many of you who are architects, come at it from this place. I, I cannot ever help thinking how important the human and interaction piece is and how ultimately whatever we are actually dealing with in in cities and places we are always ultimately dealing with it for the human we must never leave that point so so i went through a series of thinking through what the human senses were um, it, it's kind of quite self-explanatory, but you know, the C is we, we need to see the whites of people's eyes and that's much more than just Zoom and human on, interaction, human contact is so important to our ongoing creativity and innovation. We can't ignore that. Um, hearing is so important. I'm personally incredibly sensitive to sound. So I find that a really big one for me. Um, but that nature versus manufactured sound, you know, people hearing uh, their own bird song for the first time in decades and actually recognizing it and acknowledging it and enjoying it. Um, it you want to smell and, um, people particularly picking up the difference in um, smells in their places when we've got unpolluted space. And, and, and that got people thinking about the, the real issues around mitigating impacts of climate change when many of those same people had not accepted that was even a thing before. You go on to touch and, and, and some people are more tactile than others, but the human touch is a really critical thing for the human spirit. And that's why these contaminated spaces of um, COVID became such an enormous worry for many people and still are. And you go on to taste, and I can't help being slightly flippant for a moment, all those experimental bakers. Uh, I was already a baker, but there were many new ones. I, perhaps not very successful in some cases, but it really got people uh, focusing on this spotlight of food provenance uh, and then packaging waste and then hold a, a whole load of other things to boot. And, and what it kind of got me thinking was then the sixth sense, which for me, I believe is so, so important and so many people miss it. What's in your gut? What is the instinct that things tell you beyond theory, beyond academia, beyond all these things? What's your gut telling you? And for me, my gut's absolutely telling me we need to all share the losses of this global pandemic and not compete against each other. We need to recognise that ambition, vision, free thinking will shape the future of our places. And we need to recognise that 
we are starting from a different place in each location and there's been a lot of talk about tactical urbanism and coming from an urban geography perspective that fills me with utter horror and excitement in equal measure it's very difficult to move backwards very far when you're in an advanced community to accept that just chucking a few sandbags out and a kitty old chair is is positive and and is is doable in a place so there's some kind of issues around that, but nevertheless, it's about trying to understand and use our intuition to create better, more inclusive, more resilient and sustainable places. That moves me on to the next one, um, which is about forecasting sector shift demand. We've actually heard lots of our speakers talk about different pieces of this. So I'm not going to go through all the detail in the interest of time, but a couple I would pick up. I think it's a really wonderful opportunity to get that kind of... Um, independent community spirit spirit back into our commercial places whether that be in the retail whether it be in hospitality whether it be in office call and not just be managed and controlled by the global giants there's a lot more to say on that and particularly around the office space i think there's some really interesting opportunities um not least for um build studios when you're talking about co-working spaces there are two needs for offices i think those who are no longer commuting full time but need a sense of space with others and that not, isn't necessarily their own counterparts in their industry. It's about people, it's about human interaction. And then finally, rapidly um, finishing to say, I, I can't give this one justice given the timing, but it, the headline is probably enough to get people thinking and pick up and tie up some of the other speakers' comments, which is, I got really anxious about people's lack of recognition of this democratic place balance. Whose place is it anyway? There's a really interesting piece around the kind of indigenous heritage of places and that is really important but not at the expense of anything else we have to interweave that with the the new emerging advancing communities of our place whatever that is gender race color creed any of those things are equally important in recognizing it's our place that's where i'll stop helen Julie, wonderful um, to hear your thoughts on this. And I think, um, you know, I've been really struck throughout the presentations about the, the sort of the, the common threads that are coming through around this idea of, of kind of ownership and who are we doing this for. And um, we we we've not got questions coming through on the Zoom chat, so I'm I'm going to just take chair's prerogative and and just finish with a couple of concluding remarks. Um, I'd first like to thank all our speakers. Um, I'd like to thank Luke very much for pulling this event series together. Um, I've got a thought around, um, uh, earlier I was thinking, you know, whether, whether towns and cities are, are about to experience their slow food moment. Um, and then in response to the sort of rush to keep up with tech and public infrastructure and decision-making, um, uh, kind of mechanisms that really struggle to keep pace sometimes. I do wonder whether precipitated by coronavirus, we're seeing a little bit of a return to thinking about who the cities are for and what we really need and a, a return perhaps more towards good old fashioned people centric design um, as the kind of core from which all the other things follow. Um, and another um, comment just to conclude around the pace of decision making. I think over the last few months, we've certainly found ourselves being forced to make decisions over a matter of days that would otherwise have taken us months and months and months to prepare. And whilst I would never wish to return to that sort of seat of your pants style decision making, I don't think anyone can kind of deal with that level of high octane decision making for too long. I do think that the freedom, the enforced freedom, if I can put it like that, that this situation has given us all to be prepared to take some risks and look for opportunities, new opportunities, find different ways of doing things. We've seen this a little bit with play streets, councils that previously weren't really, you know, kind of even interested in kind of um, acknowledging the concept, let alone accommodating it, have found themselves giving over more space to communities. And I think um, one thing that I hope that we can take away from all this is that confidence to give things a try um, on the basis of the best information that's available at the moment um, to take a decision, own that decision and be prepared to change our approach when the situation changes. Um, so on that note, I'm aware we're over time, but I, I wanted to let the speeches run today because I think you know, we've got such a great lineup and some brilliant insight. Um, thank you very much to all of you um, for attending today. 
Uh, as I say, this is the last uh, in our event series, um, but all of them are available uh, on our YouTube um, uh, channel. If any of you um, would like to uh, kind of catch up on them later, um, we've taken a lot of inspiration. There are a number of subjects that I particularly want to pick up on um, for future events, not least around um, collaboration um, and the opportunities arising from that. And also this um, question that came up in an earlier session about supporting young practices uh, to build their portfolio. I think that's something where we've certainly seen a lot of interest in, in doing more. Um, so thank you again to all our speakers. Um, it's been a real pleasure having you here, here with us today. And um, we look forward to seeing you at um, some future events. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.